Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, this latest in the series of uh, FCC Hong Kong uh, Zoom events. Uh, tonight, I'm very, very happy to be uh, having an event about uh, Malaysian politics, talking about poli politics, race, law, the outlook for post-election Malaysia. Uh, I'm Keith Richberg. I'm the president of the FCC Hong Kong. Uh, just want you to uh, please do keep track of our events, both live events here in Hong Kong and our Zoom events. Uh, if you want to know what we're doing, please go to fcchk.org. Uh, for example, we've got a new, uh, we've got a film event coming up. If you're here in Hong Kong, you can come and watch our event. Uh, uh, it's a film event coming up on December 5th called Blurring the Color Line, Chinese in the Segregated South. That looks at the, uh, the status of Chinese in the Segregated South of, of the United States and Crystal Kwok, the filmmaker, is going to be our special guest here in Hong Kong. If you're not here in Hong Kong, uh, you can come. <laughs> yeah, you can come to Hong Kong. You only have to get an amber code for a few days or so. Uh, our event today is about Malaysia, the Malaysian election, the really exciting Malaysian election just, just that just happened. Our guest today on Zoom are uh, Abraham Ben uh, Sufian who is co-founder and director of, uh, of a program at Merdeka Center for Opinion Research. Uh, Sufian, Mr. Sufian's an entrepreneur and an innovator in public polling uh, uh, research, and he's uh, really contributed significantly to uh, better governance and policy development and citizen outreach in Malaysia. And also with us today is an uh, old friend of mine from Beijing. I think we, we met each other up there and hung out a few times, Simon Elegant. He's a journalist, former Time Magazine bureau chief for Southeast Asia and China, and he's now uh, covering the region uh, for a variety of publications from Kuala Lumpur. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, Malaysia is a place that we're all uh, we're keenly interested in. Uh, love to love to get your take on what happened and what happened in the, in the election and what's going to happen going going forward. So. Uh, Ben, Sophia, uh, can I please start with you? Just uh, how surprising uh, was this election result? First hung parliament, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, in Malaysian history. Uh, how important is that? And, and, and kind of what happened? What voting blocks voted where to get us where we are? Yeah, thank you, Keith. And thank you to the FCC for uh, hosting and organizing this event. Uh, yes, indeed, it was a fairly surprising result. We knew that the elections this time was going to see, um, you know, intense clash between the old ruling party, the National Front, and the splinter group that had emerged over the period of time. Uh, you know, notably, the Islamic Party had allied with uh, former Prime Minister Mujidin. Uh, that's one block, and then the traditional opposition with Mr. Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, is the other block. So altogether, three major coalitions or parties, as we call them. And then there's a whole bunch of other smaller parties. Results-wise, we knew that the ruling party was in trouble. We just didn't know how bad it was going to get and how big of a swing we were going to see on election day. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, you know, kind of fog of war uh, type of situation because, you know, the polling industry in Malaysia is limited. There's only a few of us doing this work. And culturally, many Malaysians are very hesitant about sharing their political views. And so as a result, um, you know, we have a high degree. We have you know, about a third of people who didn't want to disclose who they were going to vote for. They were not undecided. They, they just didn't want to tell us. So, so we had to guess where this was, uh, where the votes were going. We know it's not going to the ruling party, but you know, how how would each of the two other opposition blocks capture the vote? That's that was the big question mark. So that's point number one. So in terms of the aftermath, you know, after the election, what we've noticed is a couple of things. Mr. Anwar Ibrahim's uh, opposition coalition captured, you know. Uh, nearly all, I would say nearly all, uh, you know, 85%, 90% of the minority ethnicities vote. Ethnic Chinese, ethnic Indian votes in Malaysia went solidly for Mr. Anwar Ibrahim group, in Ibrahim's group. Um, the other opposition bloc, which is 
led by Muhyiddin, um, former prime minister, you know, Najib's former deputy before, after, after which he was fired. Um, he captured more than one half of the Muslim vote. So, mm -hmm. so he was able to get a big number of seats, 73 seats mm -hmm. out of 222, mm -hmm. just on purely the Malay Muslim votes alone. And, and that, that shrank the old ruling party to just 30 seats in parliament. And, and for information, the, the Malaysian parliament is 222 seats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and when you when you when you break that down a little bit even more, for example, I mean, did uh, Anwar's party do better in 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 the urban areas, in the cities uh, of women? I mean, can you break it down a little bit more sure. for us? Yeah, yeah, Anwar's party did better with first of all minorities. Um, you know, the the minorities are a fairly significant chunk. We have about forty percent of the population are considered minorities. You know, whether ethnic ethnic Chinese, ethnic Indians, and, and other smaller ethnicities. Right. So his party probably captured about 85% of the minority vote. I mean, we break it down further. He mm -hmm. probably captured about 90% of the Malaysian Chinese vote, about 78 to 80% of the ethnic Indian vote, but only about 15%, one five, of the oh, Muslim right. vote. Wow, okay. So that's, and then, uh, so, among the Muslim vote, the bigger proportion were women, uh, younger people, people below the age of 40 years old. Uh, and increasingly, when we look at the data set, mostly middle class or better. Lower income groups continue to vote either for the ruling party or the other Malay opposition party. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, Simon, let me bring you in here. You've been a longtime observer, a, a resident of Malaysia, observer. Were you surprised? What was most surprising for you in this result? Um, was I surprised? Uh, yes, I was surprised at the extent uh, of the swing towards, particularly to the Islamic party. I mean, I guess, I guess going on what Ben's been saying, the key thing about Malaysia, it's worth repeating, even though it might seem a bit obvious to many people, is it's probably one of the few, if a handful, if not a couple of genuinely multiracial countries in the world where uh, you know, there's, there's excellent economic growth, there's been pretty good cooperation. There's one incident back in 1969 when there was a race riot, but effectively the races are still more or less apart. So when you're looking mm -hmm. at Malaysian politics, you're talking about Malays, as Ben said, Malays, Chinese, <clears throat> increasingly, fewer numbers of, of uh, non-Malays. And also, as Ben told me when I first interviewed him for the story I was doing, if you look at the, the rate of replacement or whatever you want to call it, the birth rate, uh, in, in a couple more elections, the, the figures will be vastly different. So in other words, Malays are becoming more and more. So for me, this whole election was talking, it was largely an inter-Malay fight because uh, Anwar Ibrahim's party, which is a multiracial party, essentially is competing against four Malay votes. And as Ben just said, they did pretty badly among the Malays. They got 15%. Mm. And a lot of, as far as I, you know, and that, the part that surprised me was not so much that he didn't get the vote, but the success, the extremely mm. unusual, or the, the biggest success ever of the, the Islamic party, PAS, it's called a party, Islam, Malaysia. Uh, that was pretty shocking to many people. What, to me, what's really interesting about this is that, uh, you know, Malaysia is in some ways a, a very Isla advanced Islamic country, but it's also got elements of, uh, I wouldn't say Wahhabist or anything like that, but pretty um, fundamentalist on the East Coast, fundamentalist, uh, that's the stronghold of the, of the party Islam. So what mm -hmm. happened was in this, the first election where they've made really, really major gains in the, uh, the Northeast Part of the country where they don't normally have that much strength and i, I was actually in uh, i was up on the near penang on but in 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 the peninsula in the countryside in a, in a constituency mm. called pramatang pao which was being contested by ibrahim anwar ibrahim's daughter uh mm. noral mm. and i can tell you i was shocked if i was shocked they were really stunned she lost mm. uh it's a seat that's been held previous to her by anwar himself for many mm. years many many Years so uh, and mm. she was, you know, it's a testament first of all to the uh, to the nous of the of her of her uh, opponent who was a, 
a past guy who's uh, two wives, 11 children, and very, very savvy with TikTok. Brilliant with TikTok. Mm. Again, as Ben mentioned, uh, the appeal of the, of the particularly a past this time to younger voters was extraordinary. Uh, so I was surprised. I'm pretty sure that Amor Ibrahim's party, I know I could see it in their faces as the results were read out. People were mm. shocked and appalled. They did not know. And this is a very rural district, but it's very kind of an illustration of the way Malaysia is that you do have this contrast between the rural and the, so Penang, which is a, you know, a chip manufacturing mm. hub, a, mm. a, you know, an entrepot for whatever it is, 350 years is right there on the horizon. You can literally see it from the rice fields of Pamatang Pao. Mm. And yeah, and this charismatic daughter of Anwar lost to a very traditionalist guy who happened to also be <laughs> very good at TikTok. So I, I, I'd say, you know, the, the youth vote was very important. And, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I'd say the other thing that struck me about the change was that uh, the last election, if people do remember it, famously, 2018, the coalition that had run the country for since independence in 1957 was basically tossed out amidst a huge scandal over this, you know, basically they set up a sovereign wealth fund and stole all the money, uh, 10, 12, who knows, a lot, possibly the greatest crime ever committed in the shortest period, depending on how you analyze it. Billions, so, billions right? Billions. 10 to 12. So for a country like Malaysia, I mean, it'd be a lot of money even in the US, but for a country like Malaysia, it's a mind boggling, basically a theft from taxpayers to money that could, mm. I mean, you know, it's not directly comparable, but it is money that could go to building hospitals. So a really, at any rate, and now Najib, the prime minister then, is actually in jail. It's worth repeating that. So under those circumstances, voters did rise up and throw them out. But one of the things that happened then, again, mm. going back to the racial issue, is that the, the biggest party in parliament under the coalition that won, Anwar's coalition, although it's complicated, we won't get into who was the actual prime minister, was they won, but uh, the biggest party in parliament at that time was the, De the Chinese party, the DAP, the Democratic Action Party. Uh, and that was a big shock. And Ben, I, I definitely defer to him all this. And I'm just the outside eye looking in. He's the, he's the guy who knows. But somebody illustrated it to me this way. They said, you have to remember that if, I think it was a story I read actually to, be, to give credit where it's due, uh, or a tweet, I can't remember, you know how it is. But somebody said, think of it this way, you know, if there were, you think it's shocking and frightening to a lot of Malaysians, non-Malay Malaysians, a lot of them, that passed the Islamic party got such a huge number of seats, 40, I can't remember, 49, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but think almost the same number of seats were won by the Chinese party back in 2018. And that was shocking and frightening to many people who thought, and I, for me, that's the fulcrum of the election is this race-based fear that a lot of Malays felt frightened by the, and they felt that the, uh, that government then was identified as being quote unquote run by you know, the Chinese, run for the Chinese, not looking after Malay rights and so on. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Simon, let me stay with you for a moment and I'll, I'll switch to Ben and ask the same question. I mean, if uh, Ben mentioned that Anwar's coalition uh, only got 15%, yes. one five percent yes, of yes. the Malay Muslim vote. Simon so, first, then, then, then Ben. I mean, how do you govern a M M Malay Muslim country when you only got 15% of the Malay Muslim <laughs> vote? <laughs> well, effectively, what they've been, you know, horse trading has been going on recently. And uh, there was a long period, I guess, almost a week after the election, six, five, six days during which it's effectively Anwar's party, Anwar's, it's a coalition, but so it's him, the Chinese party. Uh, yeah, basically it's him and the Chinese, his quote unquote multiracial. But yes, essentially he was looking, he needed to find, and this is where it does get a bit complicated because there's a whole other part of Malaysia that's over in Borneo, you know, 800 miles away, uh, excuse me, 500 miles away or whatever it is, 600 miles across the South China Sea that's got some Malays, some Chinese, a bunch of indigenous people and so on. So you can either look for allies there, but yeah, it's an excellent question. How you do that? I think what one of the things that they need to do is reestablish trust uh, between uh, Anwar's party, which is called the Justice Party, or uh, and and the Malays, and convince them. I think that'll be one of the main things he'll have to do, and he'll have to get the younger people in his party to try and establish reestablish that trust that they are not, you know, shills or or proxies for for the Chinese party, whether or not. 
he's 75 years old, whether he'll serve out the entire five-year term and whether, whether he should have stepped aside and let younger people in the party is another question. But yes, he personally, I, I think Ben will confirm this, that that 15% is almost exactly equivalent to his personal popularity among Malay people too. He's not, mm -hmm. uh, he has a very low, extremely low approval rating among his own people. So uh, yeah, sorry, Ben. <laughs> yeah, well, but ben, ben, explain this to me because I, you know, I'm, I met Anwar Ibrahim in the 1980s when he was the education uh, uh, minister and then he became deputy prime minister. He was actually a, a Malay firebrand. I mean, so how, how, why is he no longer so popular among Malay Muslims when he, that was, that was how he started out in politics. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he evolved over time. I think when he got into government and, and as he ascended, you know, uh, the, the various stages of government, you know, and, and just before his fall, I, I think he reached a point where uh, he needed to moderate himself and open up to uh, the broader spectrum of the Malaysian public. And at the same time, I think he also became an internationalist in the sense that he really enjoyed uh, international events and engaging with other leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think at some point, you know, I don't quite know where, but I think he sort of walked away from that Muslim firebrand individual. Uh, and I think to this, at this point in time, he never went back there. He mm -hmm. continues to be a very eloquent, you know, uh, speaker, mm -hmm. but he's no longer that person. I mean, there is also a view that many Malay politicians in Malaysia, uh, as they rise up, they are very nationalistic uh, and and chauvinistic to some extent. Uh, I think the word that they call here is an ultra, you know, the ultra Malay. But as they get higher up into the ranks of power, they moderate themselves. Uh, and the cynical view is, it's also because they've also collected around them, you know, many Chinese business people, you know, to, <laughs> to support them and so on. Uh, but I think in the case of Anwar, uh, I think a few things happened. Number one, it's he moderated himself. Number two, um, you know, he also saw um, Islam, the, you know, the, the, the original platform of, on which he stood on uh, to be something that uh, he can use to engage in international events. So, you know, back in the late 90s, just before his fall, he liked to talk about, you know, civilizational dialogue and, and stuff like that. Yeah. After he uh, was jailed the first time with uh, Dr. Mahathir, well, that was actually his second jail term. Um, I think he, he turned even more uh, towards the international community for support and also for, for um, yeah, for support and, and also circulating out there in the, in the space. Uh, and um, at the same time, he has been a subject of intense vilification by his opponents in Malaysia for more than 20 years. You know, uh, Anwar has always been branded, uh, you know, something or another, you know, and that, that those labels have stuck all this year. He has stuck with him. And as he uh, ages, uh, more and more people, you know, get into the electoral role. And so now, as we reach this point in time, pretty much uh, no one under the age of 45 years old has a memory of Anwar when he was a government minister, minister of finance. So for many Malaysians, maybe two thirds of the Malaysian electorate, Anwar is an opposition leader, and Anwar is a guy that has been, you know, the receiving end of all kinds of labeling. Uh, and at the same time, Anwar is the guy that has been labeled as compromising uh, Malay Muslim interests in order for him to become a prime minister because he formed an alliance with uh, the Democratic Action Party, the, the so-called Chinese party. Uh, mm -hmm. for for his own election uh, programs. So that's how uh, you know, he's been cast. But I think now he has a new opportunity because he's now prime minister. I think he can reinvent and, and re-articulate himself and I think overcome some of the negativity that has built up over these decades. Mm -hmm. and, and Ben, do you think uh, Anwar will be able to hold on to power for a long time? I mean, you know, how long... 
I mean, there's no majority. So how long can this last? Well, you know, this this is the, the question <laughs> right now, because in, in a couple of days, either tomorrow or the day after, Anwar will have to announce his cabinet, his ministers. Um, and I think a great deal of speculation is about the kind of compromises that he will have to make, uh, especially with uh, the president of AMNO, Zahid Hamidi. Now, I mean, Zahid and Anwar has a very long history together. Zahid was Anwar's deputy when they were both in AMNO. Anwar got chucked out and started his own party. And Zahid has now become the prime minister, uh, the president of AMNO after Najib. Uh, now they're sort of working together again. The problem is Zahid, who is uh, the president of AMNO and National Front, um, you know, has has a court case hanging over his head. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's intensely unpopular. If there's one guy that's less popular with the Malays than Anwar, it's actually Zahid, you know. <laughs> and so for many of us, when we look at the election and we were doing the surveys, you know, during the campaign process, we thought that this election is all about Zahid. The rejection of the ruling party, you know, a great deal of it was because people disliked Zahid. They distrusted him. They, they think he's incompetent and, and things like that. Um, so now I think Anwar, maybe first, I mean, we'll soon find out in a couple of days time at, at the most, whether or not Anwar has to bring Zahid into the cabinet. And, and the purpose is not to reward Zahid, but it's actually to ensure that Zahid is there to keep national friend supporting Anwar. So it's a political expediency if it, if it turns out. If it doesn't turn out, then I think the path ahead for Anwar will be less certain because the ruling party has an internal election coming up very soon. I think by January or, or so. Uh, and at that point, I think the knives are out for Zahid. People inside the party are extremely unhappy with how you know, the National Front performed. Uh, they are also unhappy that Zahid has quickly uh, you know, made a pact with Anwar and to form this government together. They're extremely unhappy. So there, there are factions in the party that are not happy and calling for his resignation. So if the question, the question, you know, the answer to your question is, we don't know. It's very, very uncertain. But I think if they get through this patch over the next two to three months, I think the chances are the thing will stick at least for one term for maybe four or five years. Uh -huh. The reason is because it's in both National Front and Anwar's interest to be in government together so that they can build up strength, uh, improve on the leadership lineup, and prepare to contest the Islamic Party in the next election. Because the Islamic Party made serious inroads, especially amongst younger Malay voters, like younger Muslim mm -hmm. voters. Oh, interesting. So that'll be GE 16 coming up, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, si Simon, what's your, your betting man? What's your betting for how, what's your bet for how long this uh, coalition with Anwar can last? Well, as Ben says, uh, it's a very tricky period right now, but there is a confluence of interests. I mean, just to complicate the issue even further, Malaysia is a strangely structured country in some respects. So it's got nine royal families in the different states, and one of those royal families picks a king who is called the Agong and who serves every five years. Now, the, the king is immensely influence, influential and has been in this last election and has been since things got complicated, really, uh, has stepped in in a way that, in a, so far, in a fairly constitutional, it's a bit of a vague area, but they're very influential. There's a council of, uh, of, of rulers. The, you know, uh, I, I would say that, though, that I think everybody in the mm. what you might call the uh, the mainstream in Malaysia would like to see a stable government for a while. And in that sense, mm. unless somebody's ambition gets a hold of themselves, I think most people would like to, are a bit mm. frightened by what happened with uh, the Islamic Party. It, it was mm. in that sense. I think a lot of people were surprised at how strong they were and the, mm. uh, the prospect of having uh, I mean, people have been writing about the prospect of what would happen if, if the Islamic Party had won even more seats or does win even more seats. And mm. the quote unquote uh, Zimbabwe 
Islamization of Malaysia, yeah. which is you're talking about PAS, right? The... Yes, yeah. sorry, PAS, the Islamic Party. Uh, I, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but like all those things, I think it's a useful uh, a tool to illustrate why people are frightened what might actually happen. I mean, Malaysia was, uh, if you if you've been to the east coast of Malaysia, there's pretty much zero economic development. That's just not a priority for them. And obviously, an export-led economy like Malaysia is very dependent on that. So anyway, to get back to answer your question, sorry, wandering a bit here, uh, I would say my, my gut says that there is a confluence of interest where everybody from the, from the rulers to the main parties, mm. the main mainstream parties, including the National Front, uh, would like to keep things stable for a while uh, just so that they can settle them down and probably prepare mm. for the next election. But, but you never know. I mean, there's ambition, there's uh, perhaps to illustrate, to go back for one second to the, the issue of, of race and what people are frightened of because of past. So the leader of past is a guy called Hadi Awang, who has been saying things that are technically, some people are saying seditious under, Malaysia has laws against hate speech, against mm -hmm. particularly against, for very good reason. Uh, the critical thing here is to remember that the gentleman that uh, Ben mentioned, that the, what <clears throat> the prime minister the, who stepped down, it's a bit complicated, but more you didn't. What was happening was that because of the po unpopularity of, of UMNO and uh, during the election, people could see votes disappearing from the mainstream parties and going to pass, I think. And Muhyiddin made a speech on the night before the election in which he talked about there was a conspiracy between the Jews and the Christians to, uh, to, uh, put to I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing, to Christianize Malaysia, which is an idea that's just as absurd and I mean, just laughable if it weren't, but it appears, and I'm, I'd be interested mm -hmm. to hear what Ben has to say, it appears to have had a significant impact in uh, worsening the, the fears that I mentioned among many, especially younger Malays, of the idea that Anwar meant, a vote for Anwar meant uh, a vote for the Chinese. And I think that was the uh -huh. clear purpose of it. And it's clear also that since then, he himself is still very unhappy at not being in government that past themselves are very unhappy. And they're saying things that remain, as I say, very frightening. If, you're, if you know Malaysia and you see what they're trying to stir up, these are racial issues. So that, that makes it very uncertain. And indeed the, the council of rulers that I mentioned, the kings, the sultans mm -hmm. have come out specifically and the king, uh, I know it was uh, one of the other sultans who said, we must not allow this kind of racial hatred to spread. Mm -hmm. uh, we, don't, we can't allow people to, to stir up feelings like this it's a it's a you know it's a delicate business so yeah well, well, that... well simon 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 what do you think the king picked anwar to be he, he could have picked anybody to be prime minister at that point with a hung parliament why do you think he decided anwar is the man well he yeah he didn't decide for a while it went on for a <laughs> while uh he's trying to he did pick Muhyiddin before uh under similar circumstances uh they were all jockeying I really can't read his mind. And I, I would say though, that uh, first of all, his coalition did have, does have the largest number of seats in parliament. Mm. They're well short of a majority. They've only got 82 out of, uh, you know, you need a hundred and whatever it is, 11, 220. Mm. So you need mm. 111 to get there. So they're way off. And that's why they need the support of the other parties. But mm. um, I think in the midst of jockeying, I, you know, I think that, as I say, the, the king, the, they are, I mean, I don't want to go into analyzing mm -hmm. the positions of the rulers. And as Ben said, you know, in the end, it's not just UMNO politicians, but also the rulers who make a, who have a, find themselves a lot of Chinese businessmen friend, friends. Mm -hmm. I, I'm probably getting into seditious territory here. So <laughs> I've got to be careful. Be careful but, there. Be careful. Yeah, You're in Hong yeah. Kong. No, now. no, no. I, I didn't say they were. I'm just saying, you know, there are a lot of business interests involved. There's a lot of money involved. And I think maybe in the end, uh, but maybe to err on the side of, uh, you know, thinking the best of people, I, I would say, I think the Anwar represented ultimately uh, the, the most solid block of votes and the most likelihood. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the king did his job, which is to pick, you know, the person who would have the, the vote of the, mo the largest number, you know, the, the support of, of parliament in the end. Mm -hmm. Ben, do you, agree, do you agree with that? that? That the king looked at this and said, okay, Anwar has got the largest block of votes. He wasn't really looking at the fact that perhaps Anwar has got too much reliance on the Chinese party? 
Well, I, I think, you know, um, the perspective I have on the subject when talking to people who, you know, say that they know, you know, the thinking process was that I think the priority is to get a stable government, a situation where, you know, you don't, you don't change, well, rather the members of parliament don't withdraw support from the prime minister and then, you know, causing, causing another change in the prime minister and administration. So I think uh, the idea was to try and avoid that. Uh, the Islamic party and I think the concerns about the Islamic party, I think that's latent. It's not really mentioned uh, by anyone in, you know, the elites and all that. I think there are some concerns there, no doubt, uh, but it has not been said. Uh, one thing, I mean, we, we do notice about the Islamic party, I mean, they've already been in government since uh, 2020. Yeah. And since they've been in government, they actually have stopped talking about Sharia, you know, so yeah. they've actually <laughs> moderated themselves, at least in their public speeches. Mm -hmm. But no doubt, uh, because they're in government, they can expand. And I think the concern that some people have, uh, maybe some of the elites have, is that now they are the biggest party in parliament, even though uh, they didn't win the election, they, they won 43 seats by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if their bloc was able to form government with uh, BN, with the National Front, um, they will be getting dominant positions in that government. So I think the concerns are there, but never really said out loud. Uh, I, so what really transpired in the public space was the need to have um, MPs uh, or rather that, that belong to political parties that agree to be in a coalition so that there's no changes uh, moving forward. That's yeah. one point. I think the other point that I wanted to get at is this, yeah. is about the Islamic party and the use of uh, very narrow uh, uh, incitements to uh, religious fears or racial fears. Mm -hmm. that, that has been going on for a number of years. That, that's always been part and parcel of the politics here. And social media has made it more accessible. Uh, and has actually broadened uh, the reach, but also the backlash against this. Mm -hmm. My take in terms of the support that the Islamic party enjoyed in this election was, uh, it's not really uh, the people who voted them in, my view is, it's not people who really buy into the ideology, but rather a protest vote against the standing government of that time, against the prime minister of that time because of the perceived ineptitude and also the inability to solve problems and uh, you know yeah basically to get things going uh, the religious element you know was actually sold by PAS as a way of showcasing that they are humble god-fearing men uh, who are not going to do bad things um, so because they didn't really push the sharia angle in their campaigns pretty much you know uh, so that's one part. The other part was they, in many parts of the country, they campaign under a different brand. So it's only in their two states, in the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia, that they contested as the Islamic party. In the rest of the country, where they made big gains, they contested as part of the, the so-called National Alliance. And the National Alliance is, you know, really a successful rebrand because it gave the impression to many Muslim voters that here is an alternative that's safe for you to choose, that's not uh, influenced by the minorities, by the ethnic Chinese, you know? So it's safe to vote these guys. Uh, and as a bellwether, you know, we have one constituency, Putrajaya, where the administrative yeah. center is. Uh, the, the National Alliance candidate won, you know? And so, mm. so we think he captured at least 45%, uh, 47%, of the civil service vote. So that's mm. indicative. The other thing is when we look at some of the detailed results, I, I don't have full access yet. It's coming mm. in bits and pieces. Um, the swing for the Islamic party and their friends mm. uh, largely came from younger Muslim voters, people who perhaps don't really understand what the parties stand for, but just want to lodge a protest vote. Mm. So we think it's largely a protest, but no doubt there is a base. There is a base. So I think 
they captured about 55% of the Muslim vote in Malaysia. Mm. Their base, the Islamic party's base is about 35%. Mm. Their, their allies brought in another 10%, so it's 45. And then they had another 10% swing on top of that. Vote as vote. I think that's how uh, things turned out on election night. And Ben, stick with you for a second. What what do you uh, what do you think is the future for UMNO and for BN, which were the that was the ruling coalition and the ruling party. UMNO was the biggest party in BN. Yeah, I mean, are we looking at a at a at a a, a transformation of Malaysian politics now that you no longer have that dominant party? I mean, yes, we are. I mean, if you look at year on year, uh, or rather one election after the next. Over the course of, I would say, over the last seven elections or so, or maybe maybe six, the BN share of the vote has been dropping drastically. I think the highest they got was in 2004, uh, where they, they got nearly 60% of the popular vote. In this election, they just scraped through like 27%. So they've lost so much support over the years. Uh, and, and so I think it's very difficult for them to go back to where they were before. I think the only pathway for them is to focus on some areas, uh, definitely change their leadership, and then try to work on, you know, what what appears to be the middle spectrum of the Malay uh, Malay political arena. You know, so 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 we have non-Malays in Malaysia, and then we have Malays. The Malays are more traditional, more conservative. So the middle part of that Malay spectrum is further to the right compared to everyone else. But that's a space that the National Front could try and recapture mm -hmm. uh, from the Islamic party and their allies. If they don't do that, I think uh, next election, they'll be even smaller. Uh, oh. And, and you know, they, they won't disappear, but they, they'll be even more yeah, reduced as a party. Uh, uh, Simon? Same question. You know, I'm used to covering Malaysia in the in the 80s and 90s. UMNO was the dominant force. Are we looking at now a realignment? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, it, there's no question about it. It, it, it it's never going to go back to a position on what uh, in which one party like UMNO dominates the way that it did. But the question is whether or not um, who will essentially. I think Ben just said it will grab the Malay middle ground, mm. uh, and I'm no. I, I think by necessity will be uh, looking to do that, and they they are having a party meeting soon. And I'm pretty sure. Well, it, it remains to be seen because party politics are very complicated and unpredictable. But uh, if a lot of people within the party, many people, senior people even have called for. The ejection of Zahid as, as party leader. There are a lot of people who are really angry with him, and it's made worse by his conduct after the election, which he basically mm -hmm. kind of uh, forced the forced the party into a coalition, which not everybody was by any means happy with. The mm -hmm. question is whether they can rebrand themselves, get younger leaders, uh, inspire those same younger Malay voters to, to back into the middle of the road. A yeah, natural consensus. There's no reason why they shouldn't, and they've got. They've got leaders if they can get them in. They, although one of the main leaders is a guy in his mid forties called Kairi Jamaluddin, but he lost his seat because, I mean, you can debate about it, but effectively because the party elders didn't like him and they, he ended up contesting in a seat in which he didn't have that much. He, he did his best, but he didn't have much chance of, uh, of winning. But some people like him can, are certainly mm -hmm. seen as the next generation. Uh, it's a question of, how you when how and when you get rid of the you know the uh, the old guys who have been hanging on to the party for such a long time and in the case of Zahid hanging on because he as he himself explicitly said in a speech yeah. um, we got we got to win this election and we got to win it big because we need to keep from being prosecuted further. Yeah, the way, Simon, uh, the, how big a factor was one MBD? I mean we kind of know that this was a massive corruption scandal. I read the book, Billion Dollar, Billion Dollar Whale. I mean, were, were people thinking about the 1MBD scandal when they went into the voting booth, do you think? Uh, no, I don't think they were at all. I mean, I'd be interested to hear what Ben has to say. I don't think it was much of an issue at all. I think that some of the fallout from the trials 
because right before the election, about a month before, the prime minister who was prime minister during that and who was implicated in it, was who had been uh, convicted and sentenced to 12 years in jail, uh, exhausted his last appeal at the court of final appeal. The, That's the, Najib uh, Razak. Najib Razak, Razak, yeah. Who was, a, uh, who was a real stalwart, right? I mean, his father was prime minister. His father was indeed. And it gets, yeah, there's a very elite politics. So yeah, his, his uncle was prime minister too. So, uh, but he exhausted his last appeal and the Supreme Court, up, uh, uh, the federal court, which is the, to the top court in the land, effectively Supreme Court of Malaysia, um, upheld the appeal and he's now serving a, a jail sentence. He's in jail right now. I, I, as far I, you know, even talking to people, I'd spent some time talking to people in different constituencies. I, I mean, again, I, Ben would be doing a service, he'd know better, but I didn't hear anybody mention it at all. Mm. And then one other thing is worth mentioning also from, is that the voting age was lowered from 21 to oh. 18 for the first time. Oh, so wow. 1.8 okay. million vo new voters coming in. A lot of them didn't vote because that's the nature of them. But that's one of the another reason for this big swing, which is a lot of uh, young Malay voters who are looking for a party that would, you know, protect their interests. And as you know, I, I think a lot of them did not necessarily know exactly what was going on, and maybe they didn't see, uh, you know, they didn't identify by party because a lot of these the actual when you go into the voting booth, uh, the, the the it's done by uh, coalitions. So the, yes. the, the label that you see is either the, you know, Barista National, the National Front, or the, anyway, uh, I think a lot of them just thought, you know, we, we don't want the old, the old buggers like Zahid, who's under prosecution. And a lot of people were really, uh, it was definitely a factor in the election. His personal unpopularity and the fact that he was uh, um, under prosecution and, and clearly, visibly in public, as I say, stating that, we need to win this election. He essentially, said, "I don't. I can stay out of jail." And he, he almost said he was at a, a, a national front meeting, and he pointed to the other members of the coalition and said, "Just you wait. If, they, if those other guys get in and we don't win big, you're all going to be prosecuted too." Wow. He didn't make any bones about it. It was very explicit. So, uh, for, for, for if you're a young Malay voter, especially a first-time voter, and you're looking at the thing, you say, "Well, I don't want these guys because they're, you know, I don't want the." Anwar's people because they're in bed with the Chinese or whatever it is. Uh, I don't want this Umno people. So what's my alternative? Is either the Islamic party or is this middle of the road coalition? So it kind of makes sense. You're just like, well, let's see what these people can do because at least yeah. A, the Islamic people in theory are not, you know, they, they don't care yeah. about money. We'll leave that alone. But, uh, and the, the other party is a middle of the road Malay party, yeah. relatively middle of the road. So there weren't a lot of choices if you were a young young Malay voter. I think if you see it that way, it's kind of clear why a lot sure. of people went with it. Yeah, uh, Ben, do you agree? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm curious, you know, the the you know what people were thinking about one MBD in this massive, at least overseas, it was a massive scandal. But I'm not sure how it's seen in Malaysia. Well, I mean, for the average Malaysian, the one MDB episode has passed uh, because they saw Najib go into jail. But they are also aware that you know people like Zahid, you know the current president of the ruling party, and a few other characters, still have court cases uh, that they are still you know defending themselves, and so there's this whole term called the court cluster, you know, and right now the court cluster shouldn't be in cabinet. Um, so one MDB is something that is there, but there's also I think a sense of unfinished business on the part of uh, Malaysians. They felt that that's yeah that's huge and, and the government has uh, Mahathir and and uh, you know the the government of that time had tried to address that but the problem remains and the perception is that uh, it hasn't gone away you know there are other forms of corruption there's other business contracts that have been uh, captured and people are still getting away so the people feel that it's it's not over, but it's not, it's not one MDB itself, but there's still a lot of problems. And so that's mm -hmm. also one of the reasons why uh, they swung against uh, the National Front in this election. And they gave their votes to the Islamic Party because they perceive that the Islamic Party is you know, cleaner compared to the other guys. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, yeah, it didn't come up at all. I mean, people did not use one MDB as an election uh, plot device yeah. anymore really? but okay. at the back of the minds of voters 
corruption is still a big problem in Malaysia. Yeah, and by the way, if anybody is watching us live here, you can send a question to our two, two excellent guests here to question, singular, question at fcchk.org. Question, singular, at fcchk.org. If you've got a question, send it there. I'll read it out to you. But uh, Ben, let me stick with you for just a second here because uh, I, had, I did have an earlier question from uh, our friend and colleague, Philip Bowring, who helped set up the talk here. Uh, today, who just wanted you to chat a little bit about uh, Sabah and Sabah Rock. Um, yeah. Apparently, those were not really important in previous elections, but now they seem to be sitting in the kind of cat seat, right? I mean, they, they seem to yeah. be somewhat kingmakers. I mean, what is that? And, and what, what's their agenda? <laughs> well, with Sabah and Sarawak, you know, they have their own uh, local parties. And they, their own local parties have sort of coalesced into their own kind of groupings. And they have uh, uh, basically, in order to strengthen their bargaining power with the central government, their main agenda is to get to get more autonomy, to, to, devol to have more devolution of federal powers to them. Mm -hmm. I think the, the three things that they were looking for is they want to, have, they want to handle their own economic affairs. Mm -hmm. They want to uh, run their own education system. And then uh, they want to also do their own public works uh, uh, expenditure as well. I mean, they, they want to determine uh, the, the, uh, how federal funds are spent in their state. Besides that, I think the ongoing demand has always been they want a bigger share of the taxes of the petroleum revenues, uh, any oil and gas that's extracted from their area. So, that's been long standing, and they've been mm -hmm. because you know the mainland parties couldn't get a majority by themselves, mm -hmm. and so the Sarawak party and now the Sabah parties have become important because you need them to make up the numbers in government, and so that that doesn't come cheap, uh, and the uh, um, the 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 issue is, you know, how much more do they have to give up from Petronas, you know, the Malaysian oil company, yeah. uh, you know, more concessions need to be given to these states. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, let, 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 me, let me pose this question first to, to, to Simon and you, Ben. I mean, do you, do you expect, Anwar is now PM, he may last for a while. Uh, do you expect any changes in foreign policy and particularly with relations to China? Uh, South China Sea dispute, etc. What are you, what are you, what are you looking for? Uh, if I go first, I would say, you know, uh, uh, I think we've mentioned, touched on before. And when you interviewed him, when he was still a relative firebrand, but he was already, he was very, I don't know, was very much oriented, kind of towards. Uh, he liked to position himself as a, a moderate Islamic leader, with ties to the West. He had. He spoke at conferences. He was he he really clearly enjoyed that. He liked yes. he liked that yeah. aspect of foreign policy. I don't see that there would really be any change, and I think he'd be welcomed uh, in that. But of course, in terms of the South China Sea, I mean, there's not much that Malaysia or a lot of nations, except mm -hmm. maybe Vietnam, can do in the South China Sea in terms of actually resisting China. But uh, I say he'll try the careful path and and continue to uh, you know. Uh, it's such an important trade partner, obviously China for Malaysia. Sure. I don't, I don't see any radical. I certainly, uh, you know, Malaysia's also always been strongly pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel. Obviously, to put it mildly, I don't think that will change. I, I don't see any huge changes, except maybe more of an inclination to be a bit more pro, pro, pro-Western. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that that kind of thing. That's mm -hmm. about all. Yeah. Uh, uh, ben, what do you think? Any in, foreign policy and specifically anything in, in Asia or China? Change, any changes on the Anwar government? I, um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be a major departure. Uh, I think the only difference is that maybe he will try, because he likes the international angle as well, he might try to you know, um, use ASEAN uh, more as a platform, uh, maybe better coordinated with Indonesia, uh, on, on certain issues, and I think there maybe Myanmar, uh, the problem of Myanmar and their membership in ASEAN, he might say something about that. But I can't uh, imagine any major departure from what the country's current position is. It will continue to tread a very fine line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Ben, 
start with you, Ben, and then and then to Simon. What do you? Anwar's got a. He's promised a lot. He's got a big agenda. You know, easing corruption. I guess he's not taking his salary, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, a lot of things going on there. Can can you think he can deliver? What what do you what what's your prognosis for the next couple of years, the next few years of the Anwar-led government? Well, I think you know before we go into the promises, I think he he's inherited a lot of problems in the sense that uh, the government you know has a revenue constraint. Uh, you know they're not taxing enough, uh, and petroleum revenues on which they've relied on for decades, you know that's no longer enough to cover everything. In fact, in twenty twenty three, for the first time. Uh, the Malaysian government will have to borrow money to service debt. And so that's a, a, for us, you know, it's a landmark event because basically it just means that, you know, you can make ends meet. Uh, and so I think you know, the immediate thing he has to address is, you know, how does he reduce the cost of running government? And a big part of that is uh, the huge subsidy regime that, you know, he has inherited because successive governments have never been able to Master the political will to cut back on subsidies, uh, so he has to he has to do that, and and he also has to find ways to raise taxes. His uh, coalition in twenty eighteen, when they won that election, they actually cut taxes, they cut the sales tax, and then they had to bring something back, but it was never enough, you know, uh, it didn't didn't fill up, uh, you know, the meet the shortfall. So he has to fix government finances first. Because otherwise, then everything you know will have to give. Uh, so if he maintains the subsidy regime, then the government will have to cut back on public services, and that's going to be a big problem that uh, is going to create more more unhappiness, more dissatisfaction against him. So I think you know he's probably, from what I gather, he's more focused on the economy uh, and fixing government finances. I think assembling a team uh, internally to help him you know figure it out. His first uh, agenda or first activity as prime minister on Sunday was to call a meeting uh, and on on something on an inflation committee, you know, to talk about how do they address this problem. So I think he's you know set himself as pretty much on the right path. Um, but the other items like you know good governance, separation of powers, uh, you know, reducing the concentration of power in the office of the prime minister. I think that's going to be done later, uh, later in the sense that it takes time to do it and he needs the support of his uh, coalition partners. Uh, he's, you know, in his first public address to civil servants on, uh, I think, uh, Monday, uh, he's uh, actually told them that, you know, no more open, uh, no more negotiated contracts and things like that. Uh, so, so I'm not sure how he's going to achieve that. There mm -hmm. might be exceptions to the rule, I suppose. You know, so um, not easy. Uh, so for the other things that he set out to do, the, the anti-corruption uh, items, yeah. I think that, that will take time and it wouldn't be so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon, you, what do you think? I mean, Anwar has laid out a pretty ambitious agenda and there's a lot of, there's a lot of expectation and hope, probably more from the international community than even in Malaysia piled on this guy who we have seen as this, you know, you know, wronged opposition leader for many, many, many years, but can he, can he deliver? Uh, I mean, I agree that it's, it's really about the, the economy stupid in this case, it, you know, it's extremely urgent. It is definitely significant that his first meeting on Sunday was uh, addressing what many other leaders around the world are trying to address right now, which is, a committee on inflation and prices and subsequent most of the activity that he's been doing since then has addressed this and of course not only is Malaysia going to have to pay for the for, uh, to, uh, to borrow to to pay uh, the, the uh, interest on its debt but it's also still got that gigantic 10 12 billion dollar loss you know suffering under that too and a very small tax base and declining revenues from oil so I think he's very strong he's making it clear that he is strongly focused I do think that uh, even though some people might find them slightly showy, mm -hmm. uh, gestures like not taking a salary, not uh, getting a new car, not refurbishing the prime minister's office. I mean, those things spring out of the whole anti-corruption thing because let's face it, Malaysia has 
you know, is a very rich country with a relatively small population, has been blessed in many ways to be, to, to you know, to be among among the Asian tigers. But it definitely ran into a, a storm in the, in the years, and in many ways, its oil is running out. It, it is facing a significant uh, plateauing at the very least, and possibly a decline. Again, that. Uh, so it, I think he's very tightly focused on, uh, mm -hmm. on on economics, and rightly so. And then, of course, he's a politician. So the mm -hmm. other thing he's going to be really tightly focused on is making sure that he tries to shore up what little popularity he has among the Malays. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh uh, last question for me, from both of you. I'll start with you, Simon, then to you, Ben. What happened to Mahathir? We thought this guy was <laughs> infallible. What, 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 what happened? Come on. <laughs> Mahathir Muhammad, come on. Okay, Simon, so what happened? <laughs> to recap, Mahathir Muhammad, 97 years old, this July, uh, two-time prime minister of Malaysia. Almost, you know, he thought he was going to be three, he thought he might get his third term. I think he fell in, he was a, he's almost a Greek version of, I wouldn't say tragedy, but hubris. I mean, the man was driven by his strong, extremely strong belief that not only did he know best, but nobody else could do anything. And the hubris element of it is that uh -huh. after he stepped down from office, he pretty much successively destroyed all the people he personally picked to succeed him. And, and this last episode was including Anwar, of course, who was his first deputy prime minister and he, whom he strove mightily to keep out of office. Uh, and then he stood at 97 in, in a place that he effectively created, at an island called Langkawi yeah. near Phuket that people probably know. Uh, I mean, he invented that island. It was nothing but rice paddies and he pumped money into it and made it a tourist destination. And he thought, but, you know, the comparison I think of is maybe Churchill after World War II. You remember, he was mm -hmm. the man who saved Britain and the rest of it. And people are pragmatic, you know. They looked at him and they thought, he's not going to get into power. They threw Churchill out and voted an athlete. And I think in this case, they were just like, you're not doing us any good whatsoever, especially younger people. To them, he's just some old dude, basically, who, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's and he, he clearly expected, he didn't campaign much. So I think the very things that made him so successful as a leader in the Greek tradition of, you know, brought him down as well. And finally, he lost his deposit. Ben, what? Mahathir Mohammed, he's a giant in Southeast Asian politics. What happened? <laughs> I think, you know, he spent a lot of his political goodwill, you know, in the, at the end of his second term, you know, in the sense that a lot of, people have deep respect for him. Even younger people who do not know him that well continue to have respect for him because they see him as a statesman and they uh, see a lot of the material development of the country and attribute that to him. And so for, for many people, you know, he's an institution. But, you know, as he enters into electoral politics and opens his mouth, you know, he... He starts to elicit you know, more negative reaction <laughs> from people. So you know he he also demolished the image that that he had created for himself and also the system had created for himself. I mean, I remember you know sometime in 2015, 2014, I I had a actually a discussion with Najib, and I asked Najib about you know about Mahathir and how Mahathir had started to criticize him. So Mahathir, you know, always criticizes the successors, right? And so, so Najib was saying, uh, yes, I, I just have to take his criticism because uh, he's an institution. I cannot go against him. You know, that, this, <laughs> this is before the whole 1MDB thing. But the problem is that the more Mahathir spoke, um, the more people realized that he's fallible just like everybody else and that he has certain views of the world that's very hard to reconcile with you know, what Malaysia needs to be because he, he continues to speak about, you know, the ethnic divide, about mm. uh, ethnic control, uh, still talks about that. And, uh, and like Simon says, you know, doesn't mm. think that anybody else is fit to run the country as he does. Uh, mm. And so, so, you know, and, and people are forced to make the choice. I mean, in this particular instance, I looked at the constituency, you know, because we were doing surveys and we were asking people, so 
we thought that maybe he could just scrape through, you know, <laughs> uh, and and win because of the Mahathir name. But you know, apparently, no, it doesn't. It the doesn't name doesn't happen. always do it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Last question, very last question. Uh, Simon first, then Ben. I always ask all, at the end of the these talks for our for our viewers here and on YouTube and our our Hong Kong audience. Tell me what you're reading these days. Can be anything. <laughs> can be fiction. Can be about Malaysia. Can be about anything in the world. What are you reading these days? What do you recommend? Uh, well, I just got and I'm looking forward to reading. It. It's actually a book by a Hong Kong Chinese author called Xu Xi. It's called Monkey in Residence. I just downloaded it from, uh, she's done a bunch of stuff, short stories, quite a lot of stuff. It's very good about Hong Kong. And uh, this is a book of essays that I'm looking forward to reading. I haven't read it yet. Uh, okay. I'm also reading some poetry by a lady called Maggie Smith, Goldenrod. It's her new book out. Uh, spectacular, uh, very accessible, but beautiful, insightful poetry for the modern age. I, you know, Excellent. Yeah, and the last one I would say I'm reading a uh, a mystery by a guy called Michael Connolly, very famous uh, author of the Harry Bosch yeah. series. He's just got a new book out, which I'm uh, I've just started, and he's amazingly consistent. And I have also, if I may have a small plug, just finished a Please. Hong Kong crime novel with a, a Hong Kong policeman set ah. during the protest in 2019. I'm just sent out to my agent, so I'm really interested in mysteries. And Michael Connolly is the absolute master, as far as I can say. Michael, Michael Connolly, a Simon Elegant book coming out. I remember your dad. <laughs> I remember Robert Elegant's books. I, I'm a great Robert Elegant fan from way back uh, when. I'll tell him. <laughs> please do, please do, please do. Ben, what are you reading? I'm just uh, reading two books right now. One is a book by Jim Scott. It's called Weapons of the Week. It's, a, it's actually a study, a sociological study about how farmers and peasants, uh, you know, contest uh, uh, or rather engage with authority, how they do this quiet rebellion, uh, non-conformist type of tactics to avoid being coerced by the state uh, of interest is because it was a study done here in Malaysia, but it's done comparative studies in Burma and other parts of the world. And then the other book is actually a novel by an archaeologist. Uh, it's called The Fort. Um, and the it's, fort. Uh, yeah, The Fort. Uh, but it's Adrian Goldsworthy, uh, archaeologist. And, uh, but it, it's about Roman Britain <laughs> for some <laughs> reason. So, uh, so it's just something that I need to, you know, Excellent. take my mind off politics. Excellent. We're going to put that on our FCC book list, recommended by our guest speakers, uh, Ben Sufian. Thank you for joining us, Simon Elegant. Thank you. Both of you, come to Hong Kong. <laughs> come to Hong Kong. Yes. We got a platform here for you. We're open for business. We're going to be here for a while now. We, we just learned. <laughs> We're going to be here for a long time now. So come to Hong Kong. You got a stage. I'd uh, love to have you here at the FCC in person. But uh, thank you for joining us in this FCC Zoom event. Thank you. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for having me. It's my here. pleasure. Okay, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining around the world here in Hong Kong or anywhere else. Thank you and uh, fcchk.org for our future event. Thank you and good night.